Hello everyone, welcome to our Bandside Worship today. Remember our Zoom Bible study series entitled Prisms and Parallels starts this Wednesday, the 3rd of November at 8 p.m. The study will continue each Wednesday at the same time until we finish on the 1st of December. In the study, week by week, we'll explore a passage of Scripture as a prism to help us find parallels to our own situation. So, we'll think about how stories from the Bible can guide us as we try to return to something that feels more like normal, even as we continue to negotiate our way through the effects of COVID-19. If you haven't received details of the study through Bandside Buzz, contact Amy Matson or myself for the log on information. Now, tonight is Halloween. That means that tomorrow is All Saints Day. And today in worship, we'll be looking for clues as to what it means to be a saint. Our responsive call to worship draws our attention to the truth that in the tradition started by St. Paul, saints see and understand who Christ is. I'll read the slides in regular print. We'll join together for the ones in bold. We now call ourselves to worship saying, Christ is the perfect picture of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Christ created everything, things in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, kings and queens, governments and assemblies. Christ holds everything together, and Christ is the head of the church. Amen. We continue our worship of God in the hymn, God is here as we, his people, meet to offer praise and prayer. We rise and sing.
we now come into God's presence in prayer, finishing by saying the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. Generous God, through your guidance, the light of the story of the Bible, and the lived example of Jesus, as saints always in training, may we bring blessing wherever we find ourselves. May we be people of sharing in our communities. May we bring hope in our neighborhoods. May our gifts and talents always be turned to doing good, seeking justice, standing in solidarity, showing constant love, and walking humbly with you. As hard as it is to believe on account of all the ways and times we go wrong, may we be the change the world needs. May we be light in the shadows, truth in the darkness, healing in the hurt. May the gift of ourselves be a little spring of hope and joy and transformation wherever we are. Help us to know that because of your forgiveness and how you seek us out when we are lost and the way you pick us up when we fall, we do not need to live in jealousy or envy or rivalry with those around us. We only need to be ourselves, growing more like Jesus. Hear us now as we pray together as he taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive, forgive those. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trials and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So, everybody, let's think about this. What is a saint? What goes to make up a saint? Does anybody have any idea? What goes to make up a saint? What is a saint? What does a saint do? What do we think? Well, it looks like we've got something to learn then. What makes a saint. Lots and lots of things make up a saint. To be faithful, to believe in Jesus, to follow Jesus, to read the Bible, all of those things to help others. I'm thinking of two saints this morning. One is a person called St. Brendan the Navigator. St. Brendan the Navigator lived a long, long time ago. Let me ask you this. Do you know when America was discovered? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And we say Columbus discovered America. But actually, St. Brendan may have discovered America around about a thousand years before Columbus, which is pretty amazing. But the story is told that out on one of his voyages, in a tiny, tiny, tiny little boat called a caracal, St. Brenton saw what he thought was an island away in the distance. And he thought, I need a bit of a rest from all of this paddling in my small canoe. So off he paddled to the island. And he thought, you know, I'm going to cook some dinner on that island. So off he got onto the island and he lit a fire. But do you know something? the land started to wobble and move and twitch and jump because he wasn't on an island at all. He was on, can you guess, the back of a whale. And the whale didn't like to be burnt. So, St. Brendan made up with the whale 
And the whale then allowed St. Brenton to come and visit every year and to celebrate Easter on the whale back. Now, it seems to me that one of the, the stories, one of the lessons we can take from all of that is that sometimes our relationship with nature can go wrong. But if we work with nature, nature will help us. And that's a, a good message in today's world when, you know, they, the COP26 meeting is taking place about how we can do things better living with nature. The other saint that I'm thinking about today is called St. Cuthbert. Cuthbert lived in the northeast of England on a little island called Lindisfarne. And his fellow monks noticed that every night around midnight, St. Cuthbert would get up and go out. And they wondered, hmm, where is Cuthbert going late at night? So one night, one of the other monks followed him. And you know what Cuthbert did? He went to the ocean and then he started to walk in deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until the water was right up to his neck. And then he put out his hands and in that freezing water of the North Sea, he started to sing the Psalms. Ladies, that is a choir rehearsal. And he sang all night until the first glimmer of dawn. And the monk who was looking at it was just amazed. His eyes popped out of his head. And then they popped out even further. Because when St. Cuthbert came ashore, he noticed that otters came around the feet of St. Cuthbert. And you know what they did? They breathed on his feet to try and make his feet warm because he'd been standing in freezing water all night long. And they rubbed his feet with their lovely soft fur to dry him and warm him up. Now, it's a great story. And I think the lesson for us today is that things go much better when we live in harmony with nature because then nature will come to us and help us. Remember that, especially this week when you'll be hearing so much on the news about what we can do to try and put things right in the world and in our relationship with the world. And our hymn together this morning is, the church is wherever. Because the church is indeed wherever we are following Jesus and we are doing good to our neighbors and our world. The church is wherever. <laughs> Thank you. 
and the young people are now leaving for their time together. You know, it's been really lovely to have Sarah back with us both last Sunday and today. She is now going to bring us our reading, which is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And then she's going to share a little bit about her recent journey of faith and life over there in Scotland. So, over to Sarah. Hi everyone. It is so lovely to be back in this church. I have missed seeing your faces in person. So our scripture reading from Hebrews. So at the start of Hebrews 11, the writer reminds us that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Then we get a wonderful roll call referencing some of the great multitude of faithful servants of God in the Bible. As you would expect, there are big names like Noah and Abraham, Moses and Isaiah, but Rahab the prostitute gets a mention too, as well as others whose names we might not immediately recognize. As the writer puts it, in difficult circumstances, so many did amazing things as they found their weaknesses turned to strength. Some faced jeers and fogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better so that only together with us would the whole story be complete. These are the saints who have gone before us. Next, underlining how we are, on, are in relationship with this great tradition, Hebrew says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand at the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen, and may God bless to us this reading of God's word. So as you all know, I am now in Scotland. I am actually in the northeast of Scotland in a town called Stonehaven, which is about 30 minutes south of Aberdeen. So moving, coming back to Northern Ireland, and people are like, oh, it's so cold, it's so cold. I said, no, it feels great. I'm, much, I'm, I'm so used to colder weather now. I've endured a, a winter in Edinburgh with snow. As I was in, I arrived in Scotland in Edinburgh two weeks before lockdown. So I arrived on the 8th of March, and my journey began with the Church of Scotland doing a placement the last Sunday we could be in the church building. So I spent a year and a few months navigating, doing worship over Zoom and meeting church members over Zoom and then prayer and then by going with walks with them to get to know them. So it was a total unknown and I'm sure for each of you this past nearly two years has been a bunch of unknown and not knowing what we're doing and how to be church. 
But one thing I kept reminding myself, and one thing that kept being reminded to me, was that we don't do this on our own, that we have people guiding us, praying for us, trying things with us, failing with us, and saying, what do we do next? So even when we have no idea, which I feel currently in my new charge, that 95% of the time, probably 99% of the time, I really have no idea what I am doing, that I have people praying for me, I have this congregation lifting me up in prayer and reminding me that wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, I don't go alone and I don't do it alone. So I welcome your prayers as I navigate to this church, which the congregation is called Stonehaven Karenside. It is actually a union of two churches. So one of my biggest challenges, adventures, you could call it a couple of different things, is looking at with the church at which church buildings to keep and which one to sell off in the next wee while. So it's just part of the adventure and part of looking at doing ministry in this day and age, especially as the economy is recovering from a pandemic and we're all feeling the strain of that. So please do keep me in your prayers. Please keep my church in your prayers. I will continue to keep Van side and all of you wonderful people with me in my prayers. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing with us. And of course, we'll remember you. And of course, we look forward to seeing you again and hearing how things are going in Scotland, especially as you negotiate your way through those tricky issues of church property. Now we sing together the hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God. Let us pray. God who calls and shapes and challenges, speak to us out of the encouraging depths of your word and grant that we may all be doers of what you desire and not only forgetful hearers. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So what is a saint? 
how do you define the term, given that we tend to think of saints as spiritual giants who live profoundly faithful lives, have powerful religious experiences, and do amazingly miraculous things we could never possibly think about. Today, I'm going to suggest that a big part, perhaps indeed the heart of being a saint, is adding to the quality of life for others, making life better for those around us. Jesus certainly did that for blind beggars, bleeding women, and many, many, many more people. And after various misunderstandings and training exercises and false starts, the disciples did the same. It's also an important theme in the stories of the saints of the Celtic church across these islands of Ireland and Britain. I don't know if you've ever heard much about St. Blaine from Scotland. He was brought up in a monastery by his uncle, St. Catton, who is thought to be one of the first Irish missionaries to come to the Isle of Bute, found off the, the west coast of Scotland there. In the monastery, Catton and the wider community taught the young Blaine to love his neighbors and to listen attentively to God. Eventually, Blaine was ordained as a bishop. He went on pilgrimage, walking all the way to Rome. On his way back to Scotland, he was passing through a town in England. Scholars think it was Appleby in Cumbria. He stopped. He could hear crying. A boy had just died who happened to be the king's son. The boy had been blind in one eye. His body was also twisted and deformed. Blaine held the boy's hand, made the sign of the cross, and prayed. The boy came back to life. But Blaine saw that the boy was still blind in one eye. Do you know what Blaine did? He sighed. He sighed. He took away the boy's life, then held his hand again, made the sign of the cross again, and prayed again. The boy came back to life able to see with both eyes. But this time, Blaine noted that the, the boy's body was still twisted with deformity. Blaine sighed again and took away the boy's life again. You know what he did next. He held the boy's hand, made the sign of the cross, and prayed. The boy came back to life once more. He could see in both eyes, and his body was strong and straight. He could laugh and run and play. Blaine smiled and gave the boy back to his parents, alive, fully alive, with clear eyes and a strong, healthy body. What an interesting story. Now, if you were to put me on the spot and ask if I thought this really happened as told, I would have to say, mm, probably not, no. But I'd also want to insist that it seems to me this story was intentionally designed to underline and to reinforce that saints keep working even in challenging circumstances and times. They never give up until they address issues, solve problems, and enhance life 
for others as much as they possibly can. And you know, in many, many ways, when you stop and think about it, this idea of making life better is woven like a golden thread through a great number of the stories of the Celtic saints. A thread that pulls them together and gives them a shared focus. Think about this. When St. Patrick got rid of the snakes from Ireland after he had been attacked by a den of them. He was making life better for everyone on our island. And that's part of our calling too. When St. Bridget quietly, mysteriously fed the poor and then protected women in danger of being exploited, she was making life better for the overlooked and undervalued. And that's part of our calling too. When St. Columba put the Loch Ness monster in its place at the bottom of the lake, and we have been looking for it ever since, he was making life better for those living in their own little locations close to the shoreline. Do I believe that the stories of Patrick, Bridget, Columba, and so many other saints happened in exactly the way they come down to us? No, I don't. Do I think they're just silly yarns to be easily brushed off and dismissed? No, I don't believe that either. For again and again and again, in different ways, they remind us that saints add to the quality of life for others. We can think about and, of course, learn a lot from the big name saints in the Bible and in the church. St. Martha, St. Mary, St. Elizabeth, St. Peter, St. Matthew, St. Luke, St. Margaret, St. Agnes, St. Lucia, St. Bridget. St. Patrick, St. David, St. Andrew, St. George, many, many, many other saints are available. But saints are living all around us as well. What about Danny, who's everyone's friend? And Evelyn, who washes the stairs? And Trevor, who cares for the folk in the home? And Michael and Joan? and the Clares, who go out collecting for good causes each year, and ask for no praise or renown, and Ruth, who's fostered a whole host of kids, and Bob, the street sweeper in town, all of the people whose names are unknown, the quiet, the gentle, the shy, well out of the limelight, not seen in stained glass, the ones who slip quietly by, unnoticed, unheralded, seeking no praise beyond publicity's gaze, who live lives of sacrifice, service and love, and have done for all of their days. So look out for the heroes that nobody knows, and saints will come into view, and one day you'll be noticed as well, since so-and-so, golly, that's you. Surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let's continue to fix our eyes on Jesus, the source and shaper of our faith, as we keep following Him in overcoming all that diminishes and distorts, damages and destroys, and doing that in His name. Let's be the sort of saints who add to the quality of life for others, making life better for those around us. Amen.
Incredibly, you know, around a thousand years ago, St. Hildegard of Bingen said this, if we fall in love with creation deeper and deeper, we will respond to its endangerment with passion. Those words are more relevant than ever, containing a sentiment that could guide the COP26 gathering in Glasgow, which starts today. We now pray for our world. Let us pray. At the beginning, God, you created the earth and saw that it was good, soaring mountain ranges, deep dark forests, wide open prairies and desert landscapes, rivers, oceans, and lakes, each one an intricate ecosystem supporting countless irreplaceable life forms pulsing with vibrancy and color. And humans looked at the earth and said in their hearts, it is ours. And so they proceeded to degrade the earth in ways that now threaten every creature dwelling on it. Mountainsides ravaged by mining, forests slashed and burned, prairies and deserts poisoned by nuclear waste, oceans, rivers and lakes awash with discarded plastic, precious ecosystems destroyed forever by human greed and carelessness. Creator God, who entrusted to us your precious planet. Stir us from our complacency. Arouse us from our indifference. Give us the passion to act with urgency, to recognize the enormity of the threat, to seek an end to the injustice that puts comfort and profit for some above all else. Lest one day, weeping, you survey all that you created and say. Once it was good, but now it is nearly gone forever. Threatened by chaos and the collapse of the systems we depend on in all things, may we be guided by care and concern, care for the earth and a deeper awareness that we are so embedded in delicately balanced ecological webs that if we tear them, we harm ourselves. And concern for our neighbors, especially the poor and precarious and under pressure, the lost and the lonely and the left behind. Help us to create economies of equity and inclusion that redress imbalances of wealth and opportunity. Help us to restructure how we live, to provide a worthwhile life for all, and help us to change minds driven by a spirit of accumulation and domination. As if our lives depended on it, which they do, help us to live so that all life has a future of hope. In Jesus' name, amen. The hymn, Go Forth and Tell.
now, friends, whether here in church or in your homes, God grant that we who have worshipped with bandside today may be God's witnesses and saints wherever God leads us in God's world in the days ahead. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always be with us and our world. Amen. Mm -hmm.